Very good morning to you and thanks for joining us on the run-up. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. And my name is Uchechuku Onodo. Well, we're welcoming you to the show with a quick reminder that today is the 25th of January and this means that the general election is exactly one month away. Whatever we do from here on out, we should think, dream, talk, election. Uh, we also have uh, an American president once said that one must think carefully and act wisely for a lot mm. depends on it. <laughs> <laughs> so we think carefully, we act wisely. So you think about what the uh, presidential candidates have to offer, what the candidates generally, whether mm. state or, or national, have to offer and then choose wisely, not based on ethnicity, religion, even party and all that. By the way, uh, we also have Mr. Bayo Loa K here with us. Good morning and welcome to the show, sir. Good morning, Uche and Yamato. Yesterday, the president was in town and we hear that he rode on the Lagos Blue Rail uh, train. Uh, it means it's no longer a meet. And like you said yesterday, we hope that this will also help in the transportation uh, in Lagos and also the traffic that we experience every day. But do you really think this will, will help us in any way? Granted that uh, the whole mileage that was supposed to be done is not being done and it's not taking everybody from everywhere of mm. Lagos to another destination. Do you think it will help at all? I think that the um, commissioning uh, yesterday by the president is very much welcome. Uh, in the sense that at least finally we can actually see the rail project, Alaji Yaklati Jakonde's dream, uh, finally being manifested. Alaji Lati Jakonde was a civilian governor of Lagos between 1979 and 1983, and he initiated um, what was called the Lagos Metro Line, which was going to be constructed by a consortium of French companies called Internifra. And the project was going to cost approximately 77 million Naira. And the 77 million Naira was going to be sourced entirely within Nigerian banks. That was in 1979. Now, that rail project was canceled by the Buhari Ijiago administration without any reason. So it is heartwarming that finally that dream has been realized to some extent. And it is also pleasing that it is President Buhari who commissioned it. Now, uh, the, as you rightly mentioned, Yambu, the, the, the duration or the, the spanage of the network that was commissioned yesterday, even as admitted by Governor Sonwulu himself, uh, is not that much. I think it's marina to mile two. But it's a very symbolic and positive beginning. Um, secondly, I, uh, the contract for the expansion of that system, I think from mile two, if I'm correct, from mile two to semi border, was also signed during the commissioning ceremony yesterday between the Lagos State Government and the China Construction and Engineering Company if I also got that correctly. So there's pro pro uh, progress being made. Uh, the red line is almost ready from what the Lagos State Government says and should be commissioned according to Governor Songwulu before the end of the expiration of President Buhari's administration. So it means that before the end, in another four months, the red line will be commissioned. Now, when the red line is commissioned, I believe that your question will now be answered, that is, as to whether this commissioning will solve the problem or contribute to solving the perennial traffic or gridlock problem in Lagos. So I think the red line, and I think this was also alluded to by Governor Sonwudu, he said, look, this is a longer uh, distance. It, it covers a longer distance. It will definitely have a bigger impact uh, uh, on, on the transportation system. But the blue line was designed to, to cover the area where Lagos has is the largest concentration of its population. That is the Mile 2, Festa, Okukomaiko, uh, Ajeromi, Felodun, Axis. This is where it is reported that Lagos has is the highest population density. 
So we are only hoping that they can accelerate the construction of the expansion of the blue line. And it will not take almost the 15 or 18 years it has taken us to get to where we are now. I do hope it's affordable as well anyway, because sometimes uh, we heard that um, a train ride from uh, Lagos to Ibadan, uh, if you want to be very comfortable, will cost you like 6,000 naira to get to Ibadan. 6, and I was asking naira. myself, if I'm going from Ojodu Bega to Ibadan and it is just 800 naira <laughs> on a bus, how many of the 800s will enter 6,000? So I'll take like three seats or, or, four, <laughs> or four seats I just make it a private thing and get to it bad on. But they should consider it. Uh, but then, if you consider the hike in prices for uh, public transport, I mean buses now due to the fuel scarcity. And talking about fuel scarcity, uh, President Buhari also set up a 14-man steering committee. Mm on fuel scarcity. And I think he's chairing the He's community. chairing it with uh, uh, the TV Press Silva as the alternative chairman. I could never understand why a country like Nigeria would be battling fuel scarcity. Mm -hmm. it, it's, I know there's been a lot of conversations around it, people hoarding fuel, uh, downstream pointing at the upstream, mm -hmm. upstream pointing at downstream, and all that conversation. But it's still beyond me. I mean, we live with this product it is our own yeah. even though we are in the position where we export to uh, to refine and then import and all that but shouldn't it be easier why do we need to keep steering committee after committee fuel scarcity long queues after long queues year after year it's almost as if november is ending we are entering december everybody is agitated because yeah. you know what usually comes with it of fuel course. scarcity how do you react to that bio uh, <clears throat> to put it mildly, it is embarrassing. It is embarrassing. We are probably the only oil producing country that experiences this uh, mess. Uh, having said that, we could also interpret the decision of the president to chair this committee as his own expression of frustration with those he has asked, he had asked to resolve the problem. Uh, that's the way I interpret it. So the president has decided now that he will chair it. It's a simple vote of no confidence in those people that he probably had asked to solve the problem. And that's why he decided to step in himself personally. Now, the expectation I hope now would be that since the president is now chairing the committee, we should see a disappearance, or the disappearance rather, of the fuel queues in a very short time, hopefully. My problem is that the, the president is not new to the ministry, uh, that ministry. And in fact, in this administration, he is both president and minister for petroleum. And it's still happening. He has been a minister for petroleum a long time ago. So he had the experience. He carried it forth to this administration and still became minister of petroleum here uh, with Timmy Pref Silva, just a minister of state. And these things are still happening under his watch and I'm wondering what what magic he will do because as minister if he cannot do it is it as chairman of a steering committee mm -hmm. that he will make things happen I don't know why I don't know how 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 much of a difference he will make or this committee will make to ensure that we have fuel in our country because first of all he promised that the refineries will be refurbished and uh, we'll start producing our own fuel here in Nigeria nothing was done about it now Dangote is coming that's a private entity for mm -hmm. for crying out loud and he will be selling to make profit so he cannot go to the kind of price that the government would have been paying do you think a steering committee will make any difference if the Ministry of Petroleum, uh, whatever, is not doing the kind of things that we expect to get from them. For watchers of the uh, Nigerian oil industry, um, there are a lot of questions, or there are yeah, a lot of questions begging for answers. And I don't think it's something we are going to be able to to discuss in a one if, if we were to spend the whole. Um, <clears throat> duration of this program, I'm very sure we will not be able to exhaust it. But let me just try to to respond in, a, in, in you know uh, as much as I can. Um, when Buhari was Minister of Petroleum, our refineries were working. That was in the military era. 
That was between 1976 and 1979. In fact, we were building the, that administration built the Kaduna refinery during that period, mm. which was constructed by Chiyoda, a Japanese company. They built, they started building the Wari refinery, and the Wari refinery was completed during the tenure of Al Haji Shagari, who was the first civilian president of Nigeria. They expanded, I think, Port Harcourt, Alessia and Lemechi. So at that time, the refineries were working. We used to have some shortages, but that was during Hajj. And that was because, and the shortages we used to have were largely kerosene, because we had almost 2 million Nigerians performing the Holy Pilgrimage to Mecca. So a lot of aircraft were chartered, and the aircraft, they run on kerosene. And so during Hajj periods, we would have shortages. And I remember as a reporter, I covered the uh, shortages that we used to have at that time. You know, and I actually broke the story that we're having shortages because kerosene was being used to, to, to fuel the aircraft flying our pilgrims to, to, to Saudi Arabia. So the, the scenario at the time he was a minister of petroleum is completely different. And let me point out something. That administration left office, now the, the Obasanjo administration, military now, left office in 1979. Between 1979 and 1999, Nigeria did not build a single refinery, and our population went from 60 million to 120 million. Between 1979 and 1999, Nigeria did not build a single power station, and our population doubled from 60 million to 120 million. So if in 20 years you had only three refineries that you had to service 60 million people, you had only, uh, I don't know how many power stations there. We had the Borode Tama Station, Sakile, Egbin Tama Station, Shiroro, and Kenji Dam to service 60 million people, now double to 120 million. Of course, the problems we started uh, uh, experiencing in an acute form from 1999 was simply because for 20 years, not one single refinery, not one single power station was built. So we are I'm not defending anything. I'm just stating the facts. Mm. We are dealing with a long period of, of, of systemic uh, challenges. Having said that, 1999 and 2023 is enough time for us to have solved these problems. Yeah. And so this now will cause to question the commitment of the political elites that we have in the country to resolve these lingering problems that have become a monumental embarrassment. Okay, well, um, let's hope that there will be fuel. And not just that there will be fuel, that the transport, the cost of transportation will come down drastically. Because if it doesn't, well, <laughs> it, there are a lot of things, uh, you know, surrounding that. But let's move down to politics, um, because this is more like matters arising we're talking about. SDP, Lagos State Chairman, We've just heard that he has defected to the PDP. It's like a Premier League transfer window from <laughs> the chieftain of the APC uh, campaign committee leaving the fold because, according to her, the presidential candidate of APC is not physically and mentally fit to rule uh, Nigeria, even though the party came out and said he, she was sacked. But after that, we saw her hobnobbing with the main opposition. Uh, now the SDP state chairman leaving the, for the PDP it seems to be getting more and more interesting. Uh, how, 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 what's, you know, when you, okay, how do I say this? <laughs> political parties are built on ideologies. Yeah. So if you're joining a political party, you're probably joining because it befits your ideology. Mm -hmm. But that has not been the case. I mean, from, uh, if I'm to move away a bit, 1999, let's leave it aside. Mm. But after 1999, there has been a lot of moving from one political party to the other. And that, you know, begs for an answer to the question. What really is the basis for the formation of these political parties? Uh, if, it is, if it is ideology, if we have two political parties who have the same ideologies, the same, the same plans, the same outlook to things, then why do we have two of them? They should kukumali just do one. <laughs> okay. So that we'll know what we're doing. I mean, you keep seeing it's, it's beyond embarrassing and appalling that, you know, we have a country as big and thriving as Nigeria is, and we keep having these 
it, 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 you will just know that it is a clear, clear, clear case of anywhere belly face. Wherever is working for you at the time, you just mm. carry your bag and you move. And nobody is asking questions. That nobody is being held responsible for these actions. It, it, it's, I don't, I can't understand it. Anyway, but even then, um, if what the um, chieftain of the PCC of APC said is mm. true, because I haven't had that personal encounter with the APC presidential candidate and whoever else. Uh, if what she said is true, and inside her, she feels that that person cannot rule the country, hmm. and maybe she has made one or two moves, and the people still went ahead and did what they did, and she leaves. I would say she left because of her conscience because it doesn't matter the kind of ideology if this thing wouldn't work wouldn't work for the greater good of the country then you will either stay there or you leave you, you know my idea the only problem is that she went to another political party exactly. that is opposition exactly it, it doesn't it still doesn't answer the question i mean it's okay for her to leave for good conscience that is understandable but if you joined a political party because of the ideology, it means the other political party doesn't have it. So no matter what, except your ideologies has changed now. Is that what oh, you're trying to okay, tell maybe us? Maybe this is the, the next best thing. <laughs> <laughs> Bio, help us out. How, how can we make people start to see the place of ideology rather than uh, financial benefits or any other mundane benefits that these politicians seem to be craving instead of uh, patriotism and every other thing that they should be craving for. You know, Uche said it all when she said political parties are supposed to uh, be founded on ideology uh, and they are supposed to be identifiable by their ideology. Mm. If we just want to break it uh, down in, into very simple terms, uh, uh, and from what we see in other countries as well, uh, you are either a party which is heavily in favor of the industrial, uh, commercially um, savvy and uh, privileged population, that is those in charge of production, right? Or you are a political party sympathetic to the problems or challenges or aspirations of those who are the consumers. Some people, in every country, you have the group that, the elite that controls production, and then you have those who consume what is produced, right? Unless it's a socialist uh, system where the state determines uh, what to produce, for whom to produce, and how, how much to produce. So, but now, there's, there are very few socialist countries anywhere. So, we assume that you are either for the capitalist, if you like, production class, or you are for the consuming class. So even this basic definition, you know, in order to, to, to make it more clear, even that basic definition that I've just used, you cannot say which parties in Nigeria are for the, the, the production class, uh, you know, or the, or the consumption class. You might say this presidential candidate or this governorship candidate seems to be in the class of this kind of people. So this is a big challenge, and uh, the parties are not making it any easier for us. You know, when people say that, I'll come to the question of the defection later. When people say that um, we have a leadership problem in Nigeria, a lot of people say that. I don't entirely agree with that. I think we have a problem of collapse of our value system. The leadership problem in Nigeria is maybe 40%. Collapse of the value system is about 60% of our problems, in my view. But when we say we have a leadership problem in Nigeria, people forget that the political parties themselves are supposed to be agents that groom and provide and train leadership, mm. right? And the political parties themselves must be democratic. So if you say our democracy is neither here nor there, you tell me which political party in Nigeria, all the presidential candidates that have emerged, how many of them actually emerged from a true, transparent, and uh, uh, you know, clear uh, electionary to, to pick up their tickets, you know. So we have a lot of that's why we have a lot of issues around this. Now, the person who has defected, the question is, what is her reason for defecting? The one who left uh, Ashwaju's campaign team, uh, she said she she suddenly realized that uh, 
and Shivaji is not the right person. I mean, you are realizing like, about one month to the election. For me, that's a feeble excuse, okay? And the one who, who the, the lady who just, and with due respect to these people, who just defected yesterday, one month to the presidential election, you are defecting. You know, I mean, they should give us more cogent reasons. You know, I, I think all these things are more personal than than ideological or or you know fundamental. You know, I mean, this 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 would be my reaction to that. But there, there are a lot of things we need to do. You know, in terms of the structure and orientation of our political parties, virtually all the presidential candidates have moved from one party or the other to another one yeah. since 1999. So it tells us something about the process. Okay. Well. Um ideology or no ideology um i hope that one of the reasons she gave will be what nigerians will adopt if they cannot adopt ideology because she said she's leaving the sdp so that she can support the governorship candidate of pdp in this election but she still supports the sdp presidential candidate so okay so let's just say let's just take a good thing out of that that okay let people begin to look at individuals because party politics is not working mm. ideologies are not working so let's see the people because within apc there are still good people that within pdp there are good people within other parties they are very good people so let's look at individuals i feel i still party. find her reason very fishy and you know why i say that is at the time that she chose to put out this realization and act on it and she just woke up and, and she, she she actually said that the sdp was a training ground for her i mean how what is that even supposed to mean <laughs> Go and join politics. <laughs> what is that even supposed to mean? And we're a few days, I choose to call it days, a few days away from electioneering proper. And you just realize that you want to work against the uh, APC and you're supporting PTP governorship I, candidate. I can never understand, really? I can really? never understand the terminologies they use wow. in politics. For instance, one, <laughs> the one that I want to understand is why they keep saying and happily to that politics about is about interests no permanent no permanent friend no permanent foe is about interests where do your interests lie so this is a, a grammar as nigerians will call it grammar for anywhere belief is that you were talking about mm -hmm. like so long as your interest your personal mm -hmm. interest is there you just go there and give your energy which shouldn't be we shouldn't be what about the general interest of the country? Exactly. What about the community? You just think about, you know, the, the, the set of people that think the end justifies the means. I don't believe in that. It's, it's you know, it beats the entire, uh, the entire purpose of being in, you know, political office in the first place or in a political party. I mean, it's, it should be about service. The moment it becomes about personal interest, then you've lost you've it. You've lost it. Because if you're coming into politics and you are thinking about your selfish interests, then you shouldn't be there in the first place because you're supposed to be out there looking out for ways to better serve your people. Mm. And... <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah I, I, know, I hope we get it. Yeah, just yeah go on. <laughs> go ahead. If, if I just quickly, I, I agree with both of you, Richard and Yambu. And if I just quickly come in, you know, what Yambu was saying about interest, you know, actually that, that statement is absolutely correct, where you quoted it. But the problem is that individuals are arrogating it to themselves. Yeah. Whereas that statement is actually for the political parties. Because the political parties are supposed to aggregate the interest of sections of the population and to, to go into elections in order to be able to receive political power to advance the interest of that particular yeah. set of uh, population. You know, so that's what they mean when they say it's about... So if you find, for example, uh, in, in parliamentary systems where the government is usually formed by the party that won majority of the seats in parliament, that's why you see coalitions being formed. And then you, will, you may find sometimes that a left of center party and an extreme right party like in Israel go ahead and form a coalition. Strange bedfellows. But what you will hear them telling you is, okay, we have negotiated and maybe, um, maybe you have a party that doesn't want Israel to expand territories to the West Bank, which is Palestinian, okay? So, and then you suddenly find that 
a party that wants to expand into the West Bank has, has more seats and wants a coalition arrangement with a party that doesn't want that expansion. And then they reach a deal. And then the party that do doesn't want the expansion says, we have an agreement that for the period that we are in government together, there will be no expansion to the West Bank. Mm -hmm. I'm just using this as an example. Yeah. So the interest of the people that those two parties respectively are representing comes, becomes the basis of negotiation to form a coalition. So when somebody now arrogates it to uh, bring, bring it down to an individual level and says, okay, I realize this is a training ground. First of all, you don't even say such a thing. People forget that in politics, the statements you make today, well, somebody is you waiting know? to yeah. remind you of that statement mm -hmm. <laughs> 10 years from so now. True. You know, so politicians really need to be careful the kind of statements they make. You might say, look, for personal reasons, I have decided to pick up. And you are at liberty not to tell us what those personal reasons are. But whenever you are going to stipulate reasons, you really have to reflect properly before you, you, you make them. Yeah, you know, interest should be it's what's supposed to be, and it used to be mm -hmm. what the party's focus is. So, if Awolowo -Awol and his 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 party is saying we are interested in free education for everybody, wherever you find that party, you find free education. Free education. But nowadays, it's not like that. It's just me. I'm moving <laughs> to the next party because is permanent is interest no permanent friend you can move to anywhere so that's why all of them are hope not being around they're just mm -hmm. jumping from party to party wherever the the roses are and, and uh, that's blooming. why there's a lot of distrust because he, he, they keep loading if i'm to use that word a lot of things under that umbrella of mm -hmm interest mm. you, and you just mentioned that if somebody says their interest is education then you should find it wherever you find the party mm -hmm. right do we even we know what their interests we are don't. these days they just keep saying that because it's it, it, it it's it's in tandem or it's romances whatever it is that they are very interested in that we don't know about but we are the people they are leading oh my goodness oh yeah so, so sorry just quickly something i want, wanted to add yeah but we also have politicians who are loyal to the party in Nigeria, mm. but we we have a lot of. But I, if you are, if you allow me, I would mention some. If you mm -hmm. look at the PDP in the east, and when Abga emerged, Abga became very strong in the east. And then you had, you know, you, you had, and then when Enam Dekan came with his, um, you know, with his own uh, ambitions of, in his, you know, articulated for the people of the east from his own perspective, right? Mm. And he started gaining ground and so on. Some people remained loyal still to the PDP, even when PDP was not appearing to be popular anymore there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I don't want to start mentioning names. I think uh, Ihejiora and a few of them, they refused to leave the PDP. Mm -hmm. you know? And when, for example, um, in the last presidential election, Alaji Atiku Abubakar got the ticket and, and, and uh, was going to pick his running mate, those who had been loyal to PDP were not so happy that they were not consulted. But the reason I'm mentioning this thing is because these people have remained in the PDP. I, I remember them easily, and, and without prejudice to other politicians who have also remained in, whether in APC, and because I know some people who remained in APC and have refused to leave. You also have a situation where some people don't get a ticket. Everybody believes, okay, this person will get the governorship ticket or will get the senatorial ticket. And the person, for some strange reason, doesn't get that ticket. And they do not decamp from that part. They remain in that part. We have several people like that, although we don't talk about them. You know, and that's why I just thought of mentioning this scenario in the East, just to, to, to underscore the point. But we do have a lot of people who have remained in, in, in the political parties, even though you know they remain loyal but they are not getting compensated or they are not getting acknowledged they are not even getting appointments i think we should commend such people because they are sending messages to the rest of us that it shouldn't always be about posts and position and all that if you really believe in what this party stands for as unclear as what most of the parties stand for as we have said yet some people have still been loyal to them. Mm. 
Anyway, uh, <laughs> moving forward, the general elections is a few weeks away and the opposition parties have come out to say that they are worried over persistent muzzling of their political campaigns through schemes allegedly induced by the APC. However, the APC has dismissed the allegations you know, saying that it does not need underhand schemes to retain the state, and it has been ruling since 1999 through various platforms. And according to them, the APC was undermining the campaigns through destruction of their banners and posters, attacks by hoodlums, intimidation of supporters, and of course, stopping them from using billboards. And on the other hand, a Labour Party says APC is always in INEC offices sorting, separating people. PVCs, at this point, uh, they will just pray for discernment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, some of these things are allegations that we may not know. We we can see, yes, some posters are mutilated, some posters are removed, mm. some are very prominent and they are not touched. So. And some people were seen this morning <clears throat> wiping their own posters, keeping it clean. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, some allegations are like that. Yeah. In Cross River State, for instance, not only in Lagos, in Cross River State, there's been a cry uh, within the last two days that uh, the Beavers machines, uh, I don't know where they're supposed to be, but the Beavers machines were seen being... Uh, housed in government house okay so if government house is APC mm. you know uh, the governor's office and all that is APC and you're putting sensitive uh, election materials in that office so what even though the security for those things is high what will the opposition party think about so I think I next should do something about it because no matter what the outcome is, even if it is fair, it is free and all that, there's some things leading to the election mm. that might give some other people uh, the reason to raise eyebrows. So if sensitive material... That's an allegation. That's an allegation. Yeah. Yes. It, that it, is an allegation. I'm, I'm not talking about the one in... Okay, in the diva has been kept in government office. is an allegation. Uh, not, not, in, so not, in yeah. not in Cross River. Not in Cross River. In Lagos, I don't know, uh, it's an allegation, but mm -hmm. in Cross River, uh, that cry has been there and something is being done as we speak right now about it. Okay. So, but if sensitive materials are supposed to be maybe in the central bank, which is in every state mm -hmm. or somewhere very safe, it shouldn't be where it will be perceived that there might be some foul play. Is it still safe to keep it in the central bank? I don't know. I might be looking for trouble with what I'm about to say, but I'm sure I'm still going to say it. So it, do you not think that there's been a lot of, you know, that the central bank has been compromised, seeing that the governor of central bank wanted to, so you know. So where do we run to? So, yeah, because, I mean, I grew up knowing that during elections, election materials, especially presidential election materials, are left in the CBN. Mm -hmm. And then nobody, not even the governor has access to it. Mm -hmm. It is only INEC that knows where they kept their stuff. And when the day comes, they go to pick it up. Mm -hmm. So is it still safe? I mean, seeing that there has been a lot of show of uh, partisanship, you know, from the governor of the central bank, is it still okay and safe to keep election materials in the CBN? We'll just believe in God and have <laughs> it. But at least uh, that is, if that is where it should be, mm. it should be there. Whether the central bank governor, who is under fire right now, anyway, because even the people that we are saying mm. uh, he's partisan, he's bedfellows with, are the ones that are saying that he's being, he's witch hunting a lot of them <laughs> and, and doing a lot of things to scuttle their their progress country. in the campaigns and all that. So I don't know, uh, but it cannot be. Oh, Central bank should yeah. be safe, yes. Bio. Yeah, I mean, central bank is safe. The mm -hmm. question is, the people, any institution that has to do with security, that is security printing and minting company, the center, even the banks are fairly safe, okay? Yes. But the question, and I agree with you guys, the question is, um, the integrity perceived, you know, in, 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 in public relations, we say perception is everything. The perception of people, the moment that perception appears to have been compromised, a good perception is it appears to have been compromised. There's always a need, especially for public officials, to make immediate redress. The moment the governor of the central bank uh, was, was uh, alleged to be a contestant, 
Mm -hmm. That was the build, build up to the primaries before we had the candidates. And then even if he didn't say anything, we had people issuing press statements on his behalf and criticizing the others and almost justifying his right to contest him. Mm -hmm. This has never happened in the history of Nigeria. So if people are now doubting the integrity of the institution which he presides over, as Uche just uh, suggested, if there's that doubt, I think that doubt is justified because the perception, we have never had a central bank governor who, while in office, mm -hmm. is even being rumored to be a candidate. It never happened in this country. Not to talk of us actually seeing vehicles with posters of the central bank governor's image on them as a possible candidate in a, in, in a primary election of a, of a political party while he's still the sitting governor of the central bank. You know? So I think this could be the reasons now why people doubt the integrity of that institution. All right, uh, it <laughs> keeps getting I'm heated. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the tension is rising. Election is almost here with mm -hmm. us. But we will go on a quick break when we return. Uh, a bill that is supposed to uh, be nice, yes, if you ask me, was rejected by the ho state houses of assembly. You find out what bill that is when we return from this quick break. Stay and then with we'll us. take a little bit about um, our foreign policy. We've talked a lot about it, but well, let's just, by way of summary, say how the relationship between Nigeria and the world should be. All right. Stay with us. <laughs>